The movie opens in Buffalo. Dan excels at car sales because he understands customer motivation, earning the title of Salesman of the Month once again. His colleague Hal makes a flamboyant entrance to the dealership, driving as though he believes cars, and by extension, women, prefer speed. Cars like chicks, or hey, they want to go fast. However, the rest of the staff considers him odd. Dan leaves work early, eager to celebrate his anniversary, clearly cherishing his family life in their tranquil suburban neighborhood. They have three children, Nina, Kyle, and Max. Nina plans to follow her boyfriend to Iowa and switch her college major, abandoning her journalistic aspirations, much to her parents' disapproval. Kyle, struggling to communicate with his father, can barely say, mm. and chooses to visit his friend Samir instead, after Dan discourages his gaming habit. Where are you going? Samir's? Again? You made me quit gaming so I'd make friends. I made you quit gaming because blowing people's heads off 24-7 isn't exactly healthy. You know, you're meant to be babysitting tonight. It's our anniversary. An argument breaks out between Nina and Kyle over who will babysit Max during their parents' anniversary. Dan intervenes, assigning Nina the babysitting duties and suggesting it might be beneficial for Kyle to spend some time outside the home. Nina agrees reluctantly, masking her frustration as she suspects Kyle's real intentions at Samir's. The guy rides to Samir's house and hands over $200 as a rent payment for his gaming setup in the garage. Unbeknownst to his family, Kyle has gained popularity as a streamer known as Killboy, renowned for his skill in shooting games. Dan and Jessica celebrate their anniversary each year by visiting a carnival. While waiting in line for a roller coaster, some young guys watching Killboy's stream are so captivated oh man, Killboy is awesome. that they let Dan and Jessica go ahead. Dan enjoys spending time this way, but Jessica craves more excitement. I just say, oh, you're such a creature of habit. I love that about you. Oh, we have sex on Thursdays. After an exhilarating roller coaster ride, Dan promises to make their outings less predictable. During a tender moment as they kiss, someone snaps a photo without permission. Dan confronts the guy, asking him to delete it, but the young man mocks him and escalates the situation by posting the photo online and insulting them, calling Dan a loser. Jessica urges Dan to ignore it, but the provocateur spills his drink on Dan, taunting Jessica about being with a wimp. Dan, struggling to control his anger, walks away despite the disrespect. On their way home, Jessica assures Dan she didn't want him to confront the bully, knowing his strong aversion to violence. Yet, she feels secretly disappointed in him. At home, Dan reflects on the incident. He expertly changes his son's diaper. Pretty, pretty and then goes to bed to find Jessica already asleep. Oh, sh Anniversary sex. Wake up, my wake up. He mutters that he should have kicked that guy's ass, which makes Jessica laugh. <laughs> totally could have taken him, honey. Seeing her husband's disappointment, she apologizes for her reaction. The next day, Jessica vents her frustrations at a kickboxing class, where she strikes up a conversation with a woman named Gwen. While punching the heavy bag, she confides her troubles about their teenage daughter. Gwen reveals she is visiting Buffalo to see her ex. An accidental punch from Jessica lands squarely on Gwen's face, leading to an unexpected bond over smoothies. Jessica opens up about feeling trapped and frustrated with Dan's contentment with their mundane life. She reminisces about her earlier desires to travel and see the world. My husband, he's just so content being here. In Buffalo? Gwen, who turns out to be a travel agent, has to catch a flight, but leaves her business card with Jessica, offering a potential escape. While shopping with Max, Dan notices a suspicious man watching him, reacting swiftly when the man lunges at him. Dan pleads to put his baby down first. Really? So, at least let me put my kid down. But the thug is unyielding. Even with Max in tow, Dan deftly neutralizes the assailant, surprising the onlookers. Driving home, Dan navigates the streets like another famous TV family man, drawing curious glances from his neighbors, who sense a change in him. At home, Dan uncovers a secret compartment filled with guns, outdated passports, and stacks of cash. Alarmed, he contacts Augie, a former associate, to arrange new identities for his family, revealing they are in danger. Augie informs Dan that his old boss McCaffrey has been scouring the earth for him. Fearing the photo posted online may have compromised his location, Dan offers half a million dollars for new IDs and sets a meeting in Las Vegas in three days. Meet me in Vegas in three days. Vegas? Why Vegas? I can't tell my wife I'm taking her on vacation to Tempe, Arizona. Vegas, I can sell. You haven't told them? Are you mental? Augie is shocked that his family doesn't know Dan was a professional assassin and urges him to tell his family the truth. Otherwise, it will be extremely difficult to run from McCaffrey's mercenaries with the family who has no idea what's happening. Hastily, Dan packs his family's belongings. In a rush, Dan heads to his children's school and interrupts an editorial meeting to ask for Nina. 
A classmate informs him that she hasn't been the editor for three months, likely due to her boyfriend's influence. He offers her $50 for Nina's location. I'm a journalist. I don't give people up. A hundred. Try under the bleachers. That's what I thought. He finds Nina beneath the bleachers. Your dad's hot. Okay, Kelly, that's gross. <laughs> Disappointed, he expresses his frustration over her abandoning her dreams of journalism. How could you do that? You work so hard to become editor. You don't even read my stuff. Of course I do. I always do. Yeah, bullshit. However, there's no time to dwell. They must pick up her brother from the chess club, where Dan is further dismayed to learn Kyle has also quit. They drive to Samir's house, where Dan discovers Kyle has been paying to stream in the garage. Dan informs his children that they are heading to Las Vegas and instructs them to show nothing but excitement about the trip to Jessica, or he'll reveal they've been lying all the time. At Jessica's workplace, Dan persuades her to embark on the spontaneous trip she's been craving. Confused about the sudden urgency, Jessica is initially hesitant, but Dan's insistence and salesmanship win her over. <laughs> Who are you? I, mean, I don't even recognize you. Oh, you're gonna love him. He's crazy in bed. Oh. Ooh, are you sure it's not Tuesday? Impressed by this new side of Dan, she agrees excitedly. As they prepare to leave, Dan spots a black SUV parking outside the hospital and urges Jessica to leave immediately. As they exit the parking lot, McCaffrey's men appear. As the bus passes through, Dan skillfully evades the pursuers, weaving stories to explain his abrupt driving. Despite a close chase, he continues to evade their pursuers, all while keeping his family oblivious to the danger. Jesus, Sorry about that. Their lead foot? Your squirrel or something jumped out in front of me. Realizing there's a tracker in his car, Dan quickly drives into his workplace, narrowly closing the gates on the pursuers. In a hurried attempt to disguise their actions, he lifts the car with his family still inside, claiming he needs to change the oil and check the coolant. Can we not be in the car for it? While under the car, he locates the tracker and manages to remove it just as the pursuers pass by, missing them entirely. Spotting Hal about to test drive a new car, Dan encourages him to push the speed and stealthily attaches the tracker to Hal's vehicle. Get her on the freeway. You open her up and you get a ticket, it's on me. The pursuers fall for the decoy. With 33 hours left until they reach Las Vegas, Dan's wife and kids busily tweet and post about their trip. To avoid detection, Dan collects everyone's phones, declaring it a device-free trip, which frustrates the kids. Yours too. They are unaware that he plans to dispose of the phones completely. Mine too, all of us, okay? Solidarity, bye! Oh no way you just did that. Oh my gosh, what? yes! They just freed our family from the shackles of technology serious? just like that. You've lost your mind. Now, without phones, they rely on old-fashioned navigation. At the travel agency, the clerk is amused when he hears they don't have phones and pulls out dusty old maps. I'm gonna need a credit card. Dan hands him a stack of cash, asking him to book a room in a Las Vegas hotel. For the first time in a long while, the family genuinely bonds. Singing Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby on the Road, the parents and eventually the kids join in. Ice, what ice, is baby. ice Ice Baby? Creating a memorable family moment. Meanwhile, McCaffrey personally visits Dan's house. His tech guy discovers Kyle's identity as the popular streamer Killboy. McCaffrey orders all his men to locate and intercept the van. It'd be tough for him to switch cars without tipping off the family. What makes you think they don't know? They're still with him. During the stop, Nina shares her critical view of Kyle's gaming career, echoing her boyfriend's sentiments. Oh good, Trevor's here. Do you even remember what your own personality is like? No. Kyle says he misses the old Nina with her own personality, who used to be cool. While they talk, a girl recognizes Kyle and asks for a photo with him. In a bathroom along the way, Dan rehearses his confession to Jessica about his past life as an assassin, unsure how to break the news. Afterward, he goes to pay for the rooms. On his way out, Dan notices Kyle talking to that girl, which impresses the father. He asks Nina why the girl took a selfie with Kyle and why she calls him Killboy. Hey, what was all this about? Upon learning that his son is a popular gamer and the girl is going to post those pictures online, he tells the family that all the rooms are booked and they have to keep going. McCaffrey enlists a local motorcycle gang to track Dan. As they close in on a bridge, Dan notices three bikers. His family, lulled into sleep by calming music he plays through their headphones, remains unaware as he prepares his silenced gun. He tries to shake off the pursuers, while his family bobbles their heads like bobblehead dog figures on a dashboard. His mirror is shot, but he manages to get rid of one, barely avoiding a crash. Only Max is awake, enjoying the activity. He even helps his father by handing him his milk as a weapon. Dan bumps the third one, sending him flying. 
What was that? There's a little bit of a pothole there. Did you see that? I was flying. After driving all night, Dan finally closes his eyes. But his family is awake, half a mile away from the college Nina wants to attend. She argues her way into visiting it. Jessica isn't keen on going to the college just to see Nina's boyfriend. We are not going to stop and see Trevor. Actually, meant that I wanted to see campus. Oh, but whatever. Oh, right, because you're really interested in seeing the facilities. Yeah, actually, I am. Are you serious? Eventually, they visit the college, and the place is gorgeous, bustling with festivities. Dan tells Jessica that if they want Nina to listen to them, they should start listening to her first. So Jessica decides to show Nina what college life is really about. Mistaking her for a student from behind, one student offers Jessica a beer from a keg. Hey, sexy, you want me to show you how to do a keg stand? Hmm. Oh, ew. Sorry, I didn't realize you were a mom. She recalls her athletic college days and decides to show off her keg stand skills. Bear me! Impressing even Nina. Don't you ever try anything like that. That was awesome, actually. Bear me? <laughs> the main reason Nina wanted to visit the campus was because her boyfriend, Trevor, attends this college. Kyle tells Nina. You guys don't get Trevor. Uh, no, we get Trevor. We don't like Trevor. Why? Ever since you've been dating him, you've been like a completely different person. Plus, he treats you like sh You deserve more. During a campus tour, Dan admits that he's impressed by her performance. She excitedly wonders what her life would be like if she hadn't abandoned her sports career. Especially that cake stand on was so freaking hot. <laughs> yeah? Did you ever have sex on a pole vault, Matt? <laughs> don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> she also admits she likes his spontaneous behavior over the past few days. Dan spots a suspicious German man on his phone and thinks he might be an operative for McCaffrey. He starts a conversation with the man, asking about his job. Jessica notices their strange conversation. Dan begins to speak German with the man so that his wife can't understand their dialogue. Wenn du darüber reden willst, was in dem Kopf wird, bleibt es zwischen uns. Don't worry, honey, we'll catch up, okay? All right, honey. When she leaves, the man shows what's inside his briefcase. What the hell is that? Yellow corn. I sort of made this clear. So you're just German? Yeah, gonna. However, Dan realizes his mistake when he is unexpectedly attacked by a different individual. They start to fight in the chemistry lab while his family attends a tour just behind the wall. After a short scuffle, Dan incapacitates the assailant and rejoins his family shortly after to keep moving. But Nina has gone to see Trevor. Nina discovers Trevor cheating on her. You're cheating on me! Monogamy is just a construct of our Western repressive civilization. I thought we were on the same page on that! And returns in tears. Dan attempts to comfort her with his stories but realizes she doesn't need another dad lecture. Instead, he teaches her a martial arts move to inflict severe pain without lasting damage. It's a 13th century martial art. How do you even know about that? Well, maybe it's more your old man than you thought. Nina uses this move on Trevor. <laughs> taking a picture as he winces in pain, which boosts her spirit significantly. She returns to the van, appreciating her father more than ever. What did she say to her? It was just a dad lecture. Back on the road, the family bonds even more. As Nina drives, she thanks Dan for always being there for her and considers reclaiming her editorial position at school. Dan supports his daughter and expresses his admiration for her work. Seriously, piece you wrote about pervasive corruption in the Board of Education. My God, I got chills. You actually read that? Of course I did. Let me make a fan beans. At a small motel, the parents find finally relax and let off some steam. Wait, it's not Thursday. Jessica is enamored with the spontaneous side of Dan, feeling a difference in him. She suspects he was always like this before they met, and that he changed because of her. Dan reassures her that he changed because he didn't like who he was back then. The next morning, Dan calls up Augie, who is on his way to deliver the new identities to Dan and his family. The only problem is that he hasn't told them yet. You know, they might think that something's up when they have to change their name and leave the country. What are you waiting for? And Augie is freaked out upon learning that. He then sneakily returns the phone he stole and tries to prepare himself for the conversation. Kyle joins him, and they finally talk about him being a streamer. It's something he's good at, like pro-level good. He tries to explain to Dan how important it is to him. I know you think it's all just a waste of time, but it takes brains and, and reflexes. The Air Force recruits gamers. Yeah, maybe that's what I'm afraid of. He wants to prove it over a game of laser tag with Dan. Kyle proposes a bet. If he wins, he gets to start gaming again. If he loses, they will play ball in the backyard for six months. They agree on the first to three tags wins. This should be a breeze for Dan, being an ex-assassin and all. He gets the first and second tags. How are you doing this? Then Kyle retaliates with two of his own, mimicking Dan's tactics. Oh, at least I don't need a DNA test. Eventually, Dan gets the last one. 
Kyle feels conned, but the two grow closer. On their way to Vegas, they really become closer, enjoying the trip. Upon finally arriving in Las Vegas, they stay in one of the top suites in the city. Before settling in, Dan heads downstairs to meet Augie. I gotta run downstairs for a sec, don't let them raid the minibar, okay? <laughs> that is not me. <laughs> who hands him their new identities and tickets for a one-way flight to Vancouver. For a hefty price, Dan prepares himself as he plans to tell Jessica the truth over a romantic dinner while the kids babysit Max. Dan instructs them not to leave the suite under any circumstances. There's food in the supersized minibar. You do not open that door for anyone. You got it? All right, have fun. Be good. Not that he expects them to listen. Screw that, right? Oh, yeah. McCaffrey's men are already aware of Dan's location. Being a popular gamer, Kyle suggests visiting the HyperX gaming arena. Nina doesn't want to go to a place full of Kyles, but she has no other options. I think it's just down here. You're gonna love it. I already hate it. In the arena, he meets another popular gamer, Ran. Ran admits he has seen Kyle's streams and offers him a chance to meet Valkyrie and others. Ran gets to know Nina better and decides not to participate in the tournament. Um, so is this your... <laughs> oh, oh, God. No, no, no. I found him. It's over there. Valkyrie asks Kyle to take his place and join her team for the Counter-Strike Finals. However, McCaffrey's people are also on their tail. As Nina gets comfortable with Ran, he admits that Valkyrie's team stands no chance. But when all her teammates are eliminated, Kyle single-handedly decimates the enemy team. Yes! Dan tries to tell Jessica the truth in a French restaurant, but is interrupted constantly. He starts reprimanding the waiter in French for the interruptions. But what I was saying was... Oh, I don't actually speak French. They just teach us enough to sound fancy. Putain. Jessica is astonished that her husband knows two foreign languages, something she was unaware of before. Lacking the courage to reveal the truth about his past life, he begins to explain it in French. Not understanding the meaning, Jessica finds his speech very melodic and sexy. He decides to postpone his confession a bit longer and go gambling with Jess. After a while, he decides to check up on the kids, but his call goes unanswered, so they head back upstairs. At the suite, Jessica is momentarily deceived by dummies set up to look like the kids sleeping, setting Dan's mind at ease. Jessica goes to freshen up while an ominous silhouette appears in the background. She sets up a romantic atmosphere with music and love mist. Love mist? Uh, Jess! Thanks to the mist, Dan notices laser sights and dodges the bullets. He grabs a bottle of Flesha Azul tequila, where Mark Wahlberg is the biggest investor. Flesha Azul, fool, I told you! Throws the bottle. Flesha Azul, fool, I told you! And shoots it, setting the assailants on fire and neutralizing them. However, Jessica is taken hostage. Dan puts down his gun, but subtly grabs a knife. When the assailant calls Dan by the name Sean, the grim reality hits Jessica. The assailant starts talking about his plans. And then I'm gonna have my associate Hyper X, kill your kids. Dan neutralizes him as well, but the shock causes Jessica to vomit. Oh, that's normal, honey. Everybody barfs the first time. She then runs to the kids but finds the dummies. Remembering the assailant's mention of Hyper X, she knows where to find them. Shut up! I don't want to hear it. I don't even want to look at you. I just want to find my kids. They don't have their goddamn phones because you threw them away! At the gaming arena, just as Kyle ends his game with 30 kills, Dan and Jessica arrive and pick them up. Dan finally reveals the truth. Because my former co-workers are trying to kill us. <laughs> car deals. <laughs> I'm not kidding around. Ask Max. Hmm? Before I met your mom, I was a covert assassin. I escaped that life and now they found us. <laughs> <laughs> that you are like the biggest swim on the planet. However, the kids don't believe it until they are shot at. Taking cover behind a car, Dan neutralizes the mercenary. Now it's Kyle's turn to vomit. Oh, it's okay, honey. Everyone wash the first time. In the aftermath, as they take cover, Dan discloses the full extent of his past, including his role as one of McCaffrey's mercenaries responsible for 43 deaths. Kyle calls Dan a hypocrite because he banned him from gaming due to fake violence, yet he's an assassin. They now understand why Dan never wanted to leave the city and is so against and social media. He hands them their new identities. Nina is now Molly Anderson. Molly Anderson? At least you got a real name. I'm Van. I'm a vehicle. After 18 years of lies, the family refuses to accept him. Jessica decides to leave him and will take responsibility for the kids. You're a stranger named Sean. Archibald Anderson. Oh, damn it, Augie. She calls Gwen, asking for help, while Dan is left to guard outside until the very morning. Despite Dan trying to explain that it's not safe and McCaffrey will come after them, Jessica just tells him to make it safe and stay away from them. When Jessica arrives, she is amazed to see Gwen waiting for her in a private jet. What are you doing here? I wasn't expecting all this. I was on a layover nearby and I thought, I'll just come get you myself. On the jet, Gwen tells Jessica about her ex in Buffalo. They were together for years and he left her to marry another woman. Oh, you met her? 
her? Oh, I had to. He created this whole life with this woman. I needed to see what she had that I didn't. What did you do? I did what I do best. I got close. I won her trust. And then I just waited patiently for her to walk into my trap. Jessica realizes she's talking about her. She tries to flee, but McCaffrey is already there. McCaffrey gives Dan a call, showing that his family is in captivity. He arranges a meeting in an abandoned hotel. McCaffrey's henchmen are all over the place. Hello, old friend. We brought you for this, huh, Spiros? He brought everybody. Dan is flattered. Arriving at the penthouse, McCaffrey asks for a sarcastic hug. It turns out he's Dan's father. I I'm, I'm sorry, what? I'm your grandfather, Kyle. Oh, oh my oh my God, we're, we're British. McCaffrey wanted Dan dead because he abandoned him. But for the past few days, Dan has wasted every man McCaffrey sent after him. So he felt pride in his son. And now, McCaffrey wants him back. If Dan comes back to work for him, he will let his family go. But on one condition, he'll never see his family again. But no contact. Can't have you going soft on me again. And if he refuses, his family dies. With no other option, Dan agrees to do it. McCaffrey orders his henchmen to escort the family to the airport. Suddenly, the kids' morals kick in. They want Jessica to protect Dan. Kyle childishly pushes elevator buttons. While the kids try to persuade their mother that they can't abandon Dan, Jessica starts changing Max's diaper and stuffs it in the bad guy's face, throwing him off to his death. They will go get their dad back. While McCaffrey goes to make some arrangements, Gwen uses her feminine wiles to seduce Dan back into loving her, ignoring the tech guy. She's aware of Dan's tactics. The family is there to rescue him. As he puts Gwen to sleep, the tech guy is taken captive. Dan apologizes for keeping secrets from Jessica and promises to always tell her the truth. When was I going to tell you? On our first date? Our second? When you were pregnant with Nina or by our fourth? What? Do the math, Nina. He wants to be her husband and a loving father. Meanwhile, McCaffrey notices that something is wrong. By the way, the tech guy is Kyle's fan. Kyle tries out the drone, and it turns out Dan is really good with technology. You're not anti-technology, you're awesome. The henchmen are coming. He tells his family to go to the roof, and he will deal with them. Kyle will be his eyes and ears. Kyle uses the drone to spot McCaffrey's men and relays information to Dan, who despite the numbers, skillfully deals with them. McCaffrey notices that the drone is aiding Dan and wakes Gwen up to find the family. Dan tells his dad to call it off. Call it off now! But he doesn't listen, and despite 10 guys shooting with automatic rifles, no one manages to hit Dan. Noticing the elevator going up, Jessica hides the kids and shoots as the elevator arrives, but Gwen just chilled on the left. Gwen taunts Jessica, knowing that she has an advantage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, not taking her seriously. You think you can beat me because you took some kickboxing classes? You know I do this for a living, right? With solid cons still, Kyle says there are nine guys left. Dan knocks them out one by one, making McCaffrey proud. He finally shoots down the drone. Meanwhile, in the prolonged catfight, Gwen comes out victorious, burying Jessica under a pile of rubble. McCaffrey knocks Dan down and has a clear shot at him, but he has to yap about how family has made him weak. Week. Meanwhile, Gwen corners the kids, and that gives Jessica the strength to lift up the debris, but she is still thrown around like a sack of potatoes. Dan manages to remove the bullets from McCaffrey's gun, so they resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Being an ex-decathlete, Jessica picks up a bamboo stick and attempts an athletic jump, but fails miserably. Gwen thinks it's funny when Jessica tries again, but this time, Jessica throws it like a spear. There's not other events, bitch! McCaffrey beats Dan in the fight and grabs a gun to finish him off. But then the family comes in, and Nina tells McCaffrey that she's happy to find her grandpa and suggests they could become a normal family. When I look at you, I don't just see a cold-blooded killer. I see my grandpa. If you think this little speech is going to win me over... Honestly, I was just hoping it would buy him enough time to do this. This distraction gives Dan a chance to act. The family reunites and the police arrive. Six months later, Nina becomes a famous journalist by making a report about McCaffrey's assassin group. Dan starts a company teaching security guards and hires Augie. Jessica becomes a coach, and Kyle continues making videos online. The family gets ready for a big trip, packing up an RV to take Nina to Stanford. In line with their new tradition, they give up their phones. And yes guys, I know Kyle was playing Valorant. I intend intentionally called it Counter-Strike, just to see how many people would comment on it. If you enjoyed this recap, please give it a thumbs up, and make sure to subscribe to my channel.